What Lucas had in mind for this film was to take his documentary film style into the speculative fiction genre. What he had told McQuarrie was, don't worry about how we'll make it. Make it look how it should, and we'll figure out the rest later. The whole point of it was that special effects would be necessary for the film, but their sole purpose was to convince you that you were seeing something that's real. Now that might sound obvious to you, but what Lucas was going for was more than just trying to trick your eyes. What he wanted was for you to look at the screen and believe that this was something that was happening, not that you were seeing a special effect. This approach meant that Lucas was trying to shoot the film in such a way that every shot fit such a film. For example, consider this scene from the final film. Now, I can't actually show you the scene, not without drawing the ire of the copyright robots, so let me describe it for you as best I can to get a sense of that. In the wake of the destruction of Alderaan, we cut to the Millennium Falcon, where Luke practices using his lightsaber against the remote under Ben's tutelage, only for Ben to step away in obvious discomfort. Luke stops his practicing, comes over to ask what's happening, and Ben delivers the famous line, I felt a great disturbance in the force, as if millions of voices cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. That scene was about Obi-Wan's reaction to his sense of the destruction. But that reaction is in the context of the other events that are going on around him, because we have not yet seen the inside of the ship, not really. We got to see them buckling in, and that was basically it. While we do wind up cutting to a close-up shot of Obi-Wan to grasp how this has affected him, the first shot is there so that we understand the context in which this is taking place. That's a very natural thing to do. But now think about what was involved in making that happen. You have to have the aliens and the two robots in the scene, which means they have to get all dressed up in makeup and everything. You have to have the laser sword being able to move and turn off. You have to show the hovering practice device moving about. And you have to have the holographic chess pieces in the shot and moving about. What Lucas could very well have done was started on Obi-Wan, could have been an intimate sign of his reaction, and be much less involved and less expensive, actually. Indeed, it could have echoed the technique in Jaws, as Brody realized he was witnessing a shark attack on a young boy, which drives home the impact. But that wouldn't be the way you would shoot this movie if you were on location and shooting a documentary. And so consequently, that approach was out. Lucas was definitely trying to keep costs down here, but not at the expense of what his vision was. Better to keep something out of the film than to put it in there in the wrong way. Where this would be the most important would be the space combat. The shots would be dynamic, intent on capturing the action as if you were watching a war film as opposed to a science fiction film, planes as opposed to spaceships. To do this much in this way was simply unprecedented. So Lucas began with the most logical person, Douglas Trumbull, who had worked on 2001 A Space Odyssey. He was unavailable, though. Spielberg had already snatched him up for his own science fiction film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But Trumbull recommended John Dykstra, who listened to everything that Lucas said and gave him the news. With the established techniques, this could be done, but it would be prohibitively expensive. You just can't do it any other way, though. The technology it hasn't been invented yet. So, why don't we go and invent it, then? The idea Dykstra had at the center of it all was using a computer. Remember, we're talking about the early 70s here. If they were going to have a computer, it means that they'd have to build one. And that's not nothing. But nevertheless, Dykstra explained to Lucas that with the computer, you could program the camera movement and it would move exactly the same way every single time, allowing you to do these more complicated shots very easily. So that while Fox was being told that to accomplish all this stuff would be $7 million by the existing effects houses, Lucas was saying that his new, newly created special effects house, Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM for short, would do the whole thing instead for $2.3 million. Fox found the whole thing dubious, but ILM was determined to prove the viability of this idea, and Dykstra began tapping people that he knew could help form a core team to pull this off, a combination of up-and-coming college students, as well as artists and engineers that Dykstra had worked with directly or with their colleagues. Although many found the idea daunting, especially given the limited budget they were working with. 
Richard Edland, who would go on to do special effects for Ghostbusters, among other projects, was a colleague of someone who worked with Dykstra on Silent Running, but mostly took the job because of its connection to George Lucas, whose work on THX had really impressed Edland. He was soon joined by Dennis Murin in the camera department, who, like many, was skeptical of what was jokingly called the Dykstra Flex. He thought it was monopolizing their time when other, more traditional options might work better. But he was eventually sold on the idea because it offered flexibility that you could never have in a studio using the existing techniques. It would take way too much time and expense to accomplish what this new system could do, and with only one person having to man it at any time, and do it in just minutes. That was how ILM was going to save so much money, unlike in another studio when they would be paying for it to get done and all they'd have to show for it is a roll of film with some special effects on it. The major expense was to fully develop the technology, which then could be used to generate special effects for them at a low cost. By photographing the model against a blue screen, it will later be possible to add different backgrounds and other moving objects to the scene. This can be done by means of double and triple exposures. But the Dykstra Flex was just one aspect of what they were doing there, of course. It didn't matter how fancy it was if there was nothing for it to shoot. Making detailed models was an essential part of the process. No matter how realistic the camera movements might be, if the models were clearly just models, well, the whole thing would fall apart. So they began to work on what they referred to as the pirate ship the ship belonging to Han Solo. It was a real challenge, but they were quite happy with it once it was completed. So, you can imagine the frustration when Lucas let them know that they were going to completely change the design of the pirate ship. See, while development had been taking place, a new program came on the air called Space 1999, and Lucas was aghast at how similar it was to the design of the pirate ship. So he made the decision to completely redesign it, keeping only the cockpit, but scrapping the rest of it. Not wanting all that hard work to go to waste, the remains of the pirate ship was revised to serve as the rebel blockade runner from the beginning of the film. Ironically, they didn't use that model anyway. By the time they finished making all of the other models, they had learned so much about the techniques that worked best that the first one they did looked bad by comparison, so they did that one all over again. But great strides were being made at ILM to try to bring Lucas's vision to life. Of course, ILM was in California, needing easy access to the industries that support filmmaking there. That was a problem because all the acting was taking place in a different hemisphere, requiring props and sets. While Lucas was looking for a cameraman, he visited the filming of the aforementioned Lucky Lady, where he met John Barry, the production designer on that film. After talking with him, Lucas was convinced that Burry was the one they needed to create the same things that ILM was making, only on a one-to-one -one scale, to have on the set to interact with. Well, that was a very daunting task. Not only was it his job to create things that do not exist, and yet still fit into Lucas's idea that nothing should look like a sci-fi prop, but it was his job to duplicate what ILM was doing on the other side of the world. For instance, the new design of the pirate ship also included a number of items to give it a sense of texture, like had been done with 2001, using off-the-shelf model kit parts to enhance it. Well, that's all well and good, but any time they glued a little doohickey onto the ship, Barry had to duplicate that on his full-size ship, and he could hardly spend all of his time trying to recreate every single oddity at a new scale and take him forever. But then Barry was struck by an idea that was so brilliant it's actually embarrassing how obvious it is. All those model kits, what are they? They're scaled down versions of things that actually exist. All Barry's team has to do is find the actual things the models are based upon, take the same parts, and put them on their life-size model. Barry's team went off and bought literally tons of junk, which not only was useful in providing the same look to the full-size ships that the models had, but also would serve as the origin for a large number of props to fit Lucas's overall mandate. Luke's lightsaber, for instance, started out as a photographer's flash unit. Despite all the skepticism in Hollywood, they had the means to bring that script to life. 
Now the major obstacle was to actually have that script. 